And as I said earlier on there, he said, I'm not wanting to whip you up. I am. I am. Whenever Paul is writing to Timothy, he says to Timothy, to stir up the gift that is within you. There is something within you, and there is something within this church. We had an amazing, amazing night on Tuesday night with Dennis Goldsworthy. There was a number of things that stuck with me, and one of the things that he said was that you have the ingredients for revival in this place. You have the ingredients for revival in this place. And I got this image of all of these ingredients <clears throat> sitting on a table <clears throat> in a kitchen. But that's all they are. They're just ingredients sitting on a table. What they can become could be absolutely amazing. Yeah. But they're just ingredients sitting on a table. One of the main ingredients in this place for revival is you. And what is within you for revival in this place? What is in you needs to be released. What is in you needs to be stirred up. Today we celebrate the birthday of the church. It's known as the day of Pentecost. It happened in Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost, as part of, of, of Judaism, there were these series of feasts and festivals and celebrations that would happen throughout the year. One of those would be Passover. Jesus Christ was crucified at Passover. And then you have what is known as the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of the Harvest, what we call Pentecost. Seven weeks after Passover, 49 days, and then on the 50th day is the day of Pentecost. We are a Pentecostal church. We are an Elam Pentecostal church. In other words, what we believe is that what happened on the day of Pentecost is still for today. That the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost that gave birth to the early church, that He is still moving in His church today, that the gifts of the Spirit are still as much for today as what they were for the days of the apostles so we are a Pentecostal church. We believe in the moving and the empowering of the Holy Spirit in Him poured out and constantly moving in His church. So we are a Pentecostal church. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the disciples are gathered in one room. Along with many others, there are 120 gathered in this, in this room. And in Acts chapter 2, it says, in verse 2, it picks up with the word, suddenly, suddenly, a wind began to blow through. A wind from heaven shook the building, suddenly. You see, Jesus is telling his disciples prior to his, his crucifixion, prior to his arrest, he's with his disciples and he's telling them to wait in Jerusalem. He's talking to them about this gift that is going to come from the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he, later on he tells them, now wait in Jerusalem for this gift that I've already spoken to you about. Go and wait there. That's all he tells them. There is nothing in the Bible prior to this that talks about a baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is evident in the Old Testament. But this baptism in the Holy Spirit, this move of the Holy Spirit that happened in Acts chapter 2 had never happened before. This is the first time. So the disciples, they don't know what they're waiting on. Jesus has promised them. He's talking to them through, through John 14, 15, 16, 17. He has these moments with his disciples. And he's talking to them about the Holy Spirit. And then he tells them, now wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait. They don't know what they're waiting on. They haven't got a clue. Because it's never happened before. Anybody been there? We sing about, he's in the waiting. Amen. Lovely song, he's in the waiting. But the reality of living that out, how many of us actually wait? Because what you have, what you find happening, after he's resurrected from the dead, there's this movement that happens and there's not a lot of waiting by everyone. 
There are two disciples that are on a road to, on, on a road to Emmaus. And Jesus meets with them on this road to Emmaus. How many of us have stopped waiting and have walked the road to Emmaus? A place of familiarity. Doesn't necessarily have to be a bad place, but we're not waiting anymore. And it's believed that there were a lot more than 120 people that were gathered in that room. That it started off with a lot more, but 120 waited. And suddenly, suddenly, unexpectedly, no build-up, no Matt Crawford leading the worship, no worship team leading us. Just another day, but suddenly, a wind from heaven came. Tongues, what seemed like tongues of fire, appeared above them all, and the Holy Spirit comes, and the church is birthed on the day of Pentecost. Suddenly, there was a shift that took place on that day. There was a change as the Holy Spirit comes, but <clears throat> let me get something out of the way very quickly because I want to get into some stuff here. Is that the Holy Spirit, is this, this is what we want to get to. Over, over this year, we have been talking about, I want to know Him. I want to know Him and what, what that means to know Him. Not just to know about Him, but to know Him. So I'm going to ask the question here in a bit. Do you know the Holy Spirit? Because sometimes within Pentecost, we think that the only reason and the only purpose for the Holy Spirit is to come up to the front, get prayed for, go down in the Spirit, have some spine tingles down our back, and wasn't that amazing? That is not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not given to us so that we can shake, so that we can quake, so that we can fall down, so that we can get back up again. That was never the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And let me, because people are just going to pause it right there and then they're going to cut it and then they're going to just play that. It's going to happen. But for those that are here, let me take it a stage further. I got no problems with that. I love that. I wish that it would happen more often. I wish that it would happen to me more often. I've got absolutely no problems with people falling down, with people shaking, with people laughing and crying and screaming and shouting. I love it. Do it. If you're being led by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, then do it. But that's not the main purpose for the Holy Spirit. Because whenever Jesus was talking to his disciples and saying, I'm going to send you, there's going to be a gift that is going to come. The Holy Spirit, he calls them, he uses, the, he calls him, sorry, a word, he uses the word parakletos. All the DTCers in the place will know where I'm going with this. Para means alongside. And kletos can have a number of different connotations to it. But what, what Jesus is essentially saying is, he says, I've got to go, because if I don't go, then he can't come. I've got to ascend, and then he's going to descend. So unless I go, the gift, the promise of the Father can't come. The gift of the Holy Spirit can't come. The parakletos, one who will walk alongside you, one who will fill you, one who will live inside, but will, who will walk alongside. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will comfort you. He will coach you in His leading and in His guiding. So we are called to walk daily with the Holy Spirit. I love the shake and I love whenever the Holy Spirit moves in my life. I love that there. I want more and more and more of it. But unless that is transferred to Monday... Because we get up and we walk out those doors and then by Monday, everything is left on Sunday and we're back to the way we were. The Holy Spirit is for so much more than just falling down. He was sent with a purpose. He was sent with a plan. He was sent with a mandate. And he was sent with a job description. Jesus was sent with a purpose and with a plan. That was the cross. The Holy Spirit, the same thing. He didn't just come just to give us good goosebumps. So we say, oh, we're Pentecostals. We lift our hands and, and we shout and scream and worship and we fall down. And He was sent with a plan and a purpose. To live within you. To walk alongside you in every day of your life. 
And so when I ask you today, do you know the Holy Spirit? How is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? A lot of years ago, we used to go to this coffee shop on the Lisburn Road and uh, had these sofas in the coffee shop, which were pretty good because whenever people sat down, their money fell out. <laughs> and I tell you, it paid for many a, a strawberry smoothie and chocolate brownie in that place. You just got around the sofas and, and you picked out like a fiver in coins and you were able to pay for your, for your smoothie and for your chocolate brownie. It was good times. It was good days. I remember being in the coffee shop one night upstairs, sitting on one of the sofas, reaching my hand down to see what I could find. And I noticed this guy, this man walk up the stairs and go and take his seat by a table. And he was with a girl. And the reason why he caught my attention is because I recognized him. He used to be my dentist. And... Uh, and so I, he, he caught my eye. And so I'm sitting over in, in one side of the room, and I see him come up, come up and sit over in the far side of the room at this table with two chairs. He's on a date with a girl. And I see them sitting down, and I just take note, that's my dentist. I continue on with those that are gathered around my table. And, uh, and as we're talking, I glance over. And as I glanced over, I could see the two of them sitting at the table. And he's sitting, and he's got these newspapers on his table. And he's sitting with a newspaper at the table. And he's reading the newspaper. And he's completely ignoring the girl beside him. He's scrolling through the newspapers. And he's sitting here. And she's sitting over here, and I watched, and I was like, is, is that really happening? And as she's sitting there, and he's just flicking through newspapers, and I could see her sitting, and, and as she's sitting, there was all this art, because the guys who used to work in the coffee shop were all artists and musicians, and so a lot of them would have brought their art and put it up on the walls and put it up for sale, and she's looking around at the pictures and the paintings. And I see her, uh, there's just no engagement whatsoever, and, and she's sitting like this. I'll never forget it. <laughs> While he's sitting like this, he's on a date. It's not what I do on dates. Not right. <laughs> you see, the thing about about dates, bear with me for a second, is that as a guy, especially if you're not a Christian, you've got a goal. You've got a mission. Maybe if you are a Christian, then you've got the same goals and the same missions. Maybe talk about that. But the plan for a date, bear with me, I'm going with this, I'm going somewhere with this. For a guy, I'll use the word intimacy. This will not get you intimacy at the end of the night, believe that. Otherwise, she needs help. <laughs> and I watched, and there drinks came to the table, and I watched as the drinks came, and he thanked the waitress for bringing the drinks, and he went back to his newspaper, he passed over whatever his date was having that night, and he finished the paper, and he offered her the paper, and he went on to his next paper, <laughs> and honestly, it got that bad that I genuinely was this close to going over and bringing her to my table. It had got that bad. We do that with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is sitting at the other side of the table. 
with a desire to be intimate with us. And we're too busy reading newspapers. I will worship you with all my... I sang the wrong words. I will give <laughs> you all my worship. Just wait until I get a cup of coffee first. <laughs> I will give you all my worship. Just as long as it doesn't interfere with me and my life. I will give you all my worship as long as it's not during a football match. <laughs> the Holy Spirit was sent with a mandate, with a job description, with a desire. The Bible says that He lusts after us. He desires to be intimate with us. We, we, we get this thing in our, in our heads, we get Christianity mixed up, maybe it's, it's my fault, maybe it's preacher's fault. But we get this, this thing in our heads that Christianity is about what we can get. I will give. We come to give. To give. And then we get this thing in our heads about what Christianity is. Christianity is all about getting into heaven. And, that, and we make it, that, that's all it is. It's just, it's just about getting into heaven. Jesus, whenever he is on this earth, and he's quoting from Leviticus chapter 20, and um, he tells his, the people that, that are gathered, uh, he says, um, be holy as I am holy. That, that was a request of God, be holy as I am holy. In Leviticus, as he's talking to the nation of Israel. And then we get this thing about holiness. What is holiness? And I think that we get that mixed up as well. Because there are these different arguments, I think, that take place within what is a real Christian? What is it to be holy? Christianity and holiness, I think, can be used in the same, in the same sentence, in the same question. What does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be a Christian? And sometimes I think that we get this. We had this conversation this morning with our youngest my, 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 my two boys are like the moral police for society. Where, where we used to live, my eldest is playing with one of his friends and discovers that the friend that he's playing with in, in this neighborhood that we lived in, that his parents aren't married. And Judah is like, wait a minute, you tell me that you live together and you aren't married? And you have kids? And it begins to question this couple on their moral standing in life. It's one of the reasons why we moved. <laughs> this morning we have this conversation with Eli, our youngest. And he's got this friend across the street. I know quite well. And they're talking about, Eli's talking about Christianity and um, talking about the whole family being Christians. And uh, I can't remember how the conversation went, but he spilled the beans on one of the older brothers, who's probably around about 12 years of age. Well, he can't be a Christian because he says bad talk to the mother, spilling the beans. And then, uh, well, I didn't think you were a Christian because you drink wine. To the mother. And, and so we get this whole thing about Christianity, about holiness. And this is, this is an issue that the Jews had as well in the Old Testament. What is holiness? And we, and we make it about, well, I'm holy or I'm a Christian. Being a Christian is about, I don't get drunk anymore. I don't drink anymore. I don't smoke. I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't do whatever. That's what Christianity is. Because I don't do these things, then I'm holy. Or for some, they would make it an argument about what they do in church. So, because I come to church on Sunday, because I worship, because I lift my hands, because I pray, because I, because I worship, because I do all these things, then I'm holy. 
And we make all these arguments that it was never intended to be about what we don't do and about what we do do. Because whenever we make it about what we do do, then that is religion. You cannot achieve holiness by what you do. You are made holy by who He is. So we don't strive to work towards holiness. We operate from a place of holiness. It's about Him and what He has done in our lives. In John chapter 15, that we just read there, at the very beginning of that chapter, Jesus talks and He says, He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He talks about remaining in me. Everything that we are as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, comes straight from Him. You cannot achieve it. You cannot gain it. You can't go out and work for it. It is a free gift. And Jesus says, remain in me. So if you imagine a tree and these branches coming out of the tree, those branches are everything that they are because of what they're connected to. Those branches get life. Those branches get sustenance. Get their identity from what they're attached to. Because if you have a certain type of tree, then the branch will be a a branch that is associated with that tree. You will not get some kind of an evergreen branch growing out of an oak tree. It won't happen. Oak trees produce oak branches. So that's how you identify an oak tree. Because of its branches, it looks like an oak tree. And so because the branches are attached... Once you take that branch off, once you disconnect that branch and you just have a branch, that branch will no longer get what it needs from the vine and it will die. And so Jesus is saying, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Remain in me. Be connected to me. John chapter 7, he says, he, or sorry, John chapter 17, he's praying and his prayer is all, the theme of the prayer is all about unity. And he's, he's praying for unity for the church, but he's praying for unity for, for, for us and for him. That we would know him. That we would know him. That's his prayer. That we would be one with him. That we would be united with him. Encompassed in all of that is intimacy. That we would be intimate with him. We are called to intimacy, church. That's in, in the knowing is in an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. How is your relationship today with the Holy Spirit? Because he's sitting at the end of a table. He's sitting right here. And he's saying, I, I want you. I want to be intimate with you. I want to have a loving relationship. This is why I came I came to this earth, I was sent, and I came with a mandate, with a job description, with a desire in my heart to be intimate with you. I really think that we should be coming more expectant on Sundays. I really believe that we should be coming through the doors every Sunday expecting with something yearning on our hearts for God to move in this place. I really think that our desires should be stirred, not our emotions stirred up, but the desires of our heart. You see, what, what we talk about holiness and about being a Christian and about not striving to get hold of that, that that's what is going to make us holy. No, whenever I talk about us, we start from a place of holiness So as a result of who we are, we will want to. We will not want to do this, and we will want to do that. that. So it's not that we're saying, I'm not going to do that because that will make me holy. And I'm going to do this because doing this is going to make me holy. No, it's about recognizing I am holy. I am the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, I will not do that. Therefore, this is what I want to do. We've got to stir up a desire and a passion within our hearts 
We've got to shout at ourselves. We've got to speak to ourselves. It means standing in front of a mirror and saying it. And speak to yourself. Stir it up in your hearts. Stir it up in your soul and stir it up in your spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within you. Release Him. Engage with Him. Put the paper down. I don't know what the newspaper is in your life. It could be a job that is holding you back from that deep relationship. You're distancing yourself. It could be a relationship. It could be money. It could be a career. I don't know. But whatever it is that is holding you back from Him, from a deep personal relationship with Him, then you've got to cut that thing off. Can you imagine next week if we were to, if I was to say, right, next week, Jurgen Klopp's coming, bringing some players, and he's bringing the Champions League trophy. He's going to be here next Sunday at 11.15 a.m. We become an expect well, the Liverpool supporters would become an expecting. You'd be queuing up at the doors. You'd be wanting a seat at the front. You'd not want to sit at the back with your feet against my walls and dirtying them up. I see the marks. I see the lines. You'd not be with your shoulders against the wall and your arms folded. You'd be at the front. I want to see the trophy. I want to see Jurgen. I want to see what players he's got. You'd be coming expecting how much more the presence of God. How much more Jesus Christ. Because he comes every Sunday. We pray, oh Lord Jesus, will you come into this place? We pray that your presence will come into this place. It's already here, church. We're just too busy reading newspapers that we're not recognizing what's sitting right across the table from us. I'm glad somebody's stirred up in this place. Get rid of your newspapers. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 goes on. And what he says, as he's building up to this whole friends thing, we pick it up from John chapter 15 and verse 12. He says this, he says, This is my commandment, that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another. I, I could have just preached for a couple of weeks on that. I don't have time. Have you got your Bibles? Will you underline that? Will you circle it? Will you highlight it? Will you eat it? This is my commandment that you love and unf unselfishly seek the best for one another, just as I have loved you. I'll leave that with you. I don't have time to go into it. No one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you keep on doing what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you my friends because I have revealed to you everything that I have heard from my father. In verse 16, he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You never chose Jesus. You never chose to be saved. You answered a call on your life. He called you. You responded. I have chosen you. I have appointed you and placed you purpose, purposefully planted you so that you would go and bear fruit and keep on bearing that your fruit will remain and be lasting so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And then he, he says again, this is what I command you, that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another. How many people recognize that if he's repeating that, if he's saying that twice, then we got to be taking note of that. In John chapter 21, I'm finishing with this here. John chapter 21, that we've just read, is this interaction with Peter. I, lo I love the amplified heading on this here. The heading of John chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. The heading is the love motivation. The love motivation. What motivates you today? You see, sometimes we are motivated by what we can get, and we think that it is in, it's in the pursuit of those things that, that, that oh, I'm, I'm going to be holy. I prayed this morning. 
two hours. I read both of the Testaments. I am holy. We become so arrogant in what we do and it's the wrong motivation. When I had my conversion experience, I made a deal with God that if you're moving in my life in this way, if this is of you and and you're doing this, then you cannot do this for me just to sit in church. That you moving in my life in the way that you're moving is for the purpose of me doing something. So you've got to open doors. You've got to create a way for me to serve, for me to grow, to develop, to move in what you're calling me to. It was never enough for me to sit on a seat. It was never enough for me to just accept for that moment in time that God's moving and then I could disengage. I had to constantly engage with Him. Why? Because I loved Him and because I loved what He was doing in my life. And I was motivated by love. I was motivated by His love for me and by what He was doing in my life. I was motivated by a love and a passion for Him. And so, and so Jesus is with Peter. And Peter has denied, as Jesus prophesied and said that he would. Peter has denied him three times, and Peter's off. And and Peter's got this internal struggle of of where it all went wrong for him. And he's out fishing. And John says, there's Peter, or sorry, John says, that's Jesus on the shore there. And Peter jumps out of the boat, swims towards Jesus. It's on to the shore. And we're told that Jesus had this fire going and he was preparing breakfast. And it says that there was bread that was there. Breaking of bread speaks of forgiveness. And Jesus was trying to get it through to Peter. It's okay. It's okay. And the questions that he asks, he doesn't go to Peter and say, Peter, did you pray this morning, you know, so that... I can forgive you, or, or Peter, how, how much of the Bible did you read this morning, or anything like that? It wasn't about what Peter was doing. It was a simple question. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Do you genuinely love me, Peter? The love motivation. Let our lives be motivated by love for him. Let's get intimate with him. Worship team, you can come. Let's get intimate with him, with who he is, developing that deep, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Intimacy. Intimacy requires vulnerability. Intimacy requires vulnerability. Can we be adult for just a second? Intimacy requires nakedness. There's vulnerability in that. And if you want to move forward and deepen your relationship with God, then it will require you to strip yourself naked before God, to be vulnerable before Him, to strip away the facade, to strip away the masks, to strip away the walls, to strip away everything that you would project on Facebook and on Instagram and on Snapchat and in church and to be vulnerable before God, before the Holy Spirit, who will draw alongside 
who with loving arms will put them around you and will ask you one question. Do you love me? That's difficult. It sounds easy, and sometimes we make it easy because we're sitting in rows and we can sit behind our chairs and we can lift our hands or, or whatever, but we can be comfortable in our rows. And God is calling us to take a step and to put ourselves in a place of vulnerability, to become desperate for His presence, never to settle for where we are, but to dream, to have ambition, to seek depth, to seek more of Him, of His presence, of His glory revealed in this place. I wonder, do we have a desire in this place? I wonder, is the desire here in this place? Because if it's not, then we may as well just go. Do we have a desire? Do we have a hunger? Do we have a thirst for God to move? Do we have a hunger and a desire and a thirst for revival? Do we have a hunger and a desire and a thirst to go deeper in Him? Do we have a hunger and a desire and a thirst to be intimate with Him, to be vulnerable before Him? Do we have that hunger and desire and that thirst to go further than we have ever gone before, to go deeper than we have ever gone before? Do we have the desire and the hunger and the thirst to take those ingredients that are sitting on a kitchen table and to begin to use them, begin to put them together, begin to mold them and to make them into what God has ordained, what God has purposed, what God has planned? Do we have the desire? Or are we happy enough to have these amazing ingredients sitting on a table while we go out for McDonald's? He's sitting at this side of the table. He's sitting. He's here today. He's sitting at the, un at the other end of your table. He says, I want you. I want you more than you could ever know. I, I don't want you because I, I, I want to fill a church building. I, I don't want you because it'll be another person on a seat. I don't, I don't want you because it's another person going to heaven. I, I don't want you for those reasons. I want you because I love you. I love you more than you will ever know. I desire to be with you. I desire relationship with you. I want you. The Holy Spirit is saying today, I want you. Put the newspaper down. Get to know the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.